Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait, where are you running? There's no need to hurry. The trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle, and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception, though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then, your bag may end up in another part of the plane, and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh! Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon, moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. 10 miles away from another plane and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting, Traffic! Traffic! 5 miles closer and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. But you know what may help you? Noise-canceling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. 
In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes mean some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seatbelts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there is a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights. If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch some shut-eye. These bedrooms, called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds. And the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots. This made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. The marble caves in Chile are one of the most far-off natural wonders of the world. The cathedral, the chapel, and the cave are the three main attractions. They're a group of black and white caverns, columns, and tunnels made of marble. Waves have been shaping them over thousands of years, and they're still going strong. The caves and turquoise water waves team up to make a sweet light show. When summer starts, an ordinary-looking river in Colombia transforms into a liquid rainbow. Caño Cristales, also known as the most beautiful river in the world, sparkles in five colors – red, black, green, blue, and yellow. It only looks like this for six months a year because of the special underwater plant that makes all those colors. It needs the perfect amount of sunshine and water to work its magic. The river in Dakhi, India is a kayaker's dream. It's emerald and so transparent, you can see all the way to the bottom. Bright pebbles, stones, and fish, the colorful fishing boats seem to be floating on glass. The only sounds you can hear are the swirling of the river and the occasional bird flying past. 
one of the cleanest villages in the world, isn't far from the Emerald River. It has three street cleaners who work every day, even in heavy rain. The locals plant flowers and bushes all over the village, and cars aren't allowed. The parking fee for tourists is used to pay for more street cleaning. The cost of littering? A fine or even jail. Blue Lake in New Zealand is one of the world's clearest lakes. It's basically like looking at distilled water. You can even see blue-violet shades in it, which is super rare. The water comes from its neighbor, an icy glacier lake. The local Maori people don't let you swim there. You can't even dip your toes in. They believe the lake has special powers. Luskintyre Beach is an endless stretch of white sand dunes and perfect blue water. But don't let the tropical vibe fool you. It's in Scotland. That's why it only looks nice in May and June. In December, the place only gets an hour of sunshine per day, so it looks pretty bleak. Five Hour Lake in China's Jusigao Valley changes from yellow to emerald green, dark jade to light turquoise, and sometimes even coral color, which I didn't even know existed. It never freezes thanks to underwater hot springs and never dries up like some of its neighbors. The local legend is that it's made up of pieces of a mirror that fell from the sky. The surrounding valley has some of those classic hills with above-ground caves in them, spectacular waterfalls, around 140 different birds, and a couple of giant pandas and other endangered plants and animals. The Southern Ocean near Antarctica has the cleanest air in the world. It's so clear, scientists could barely find any DNA in it to analyze. Just some random marine bacteria. Antarctica itself is 99% ice and has mind-blowing blue glaciers, active volcanoes, and the best views of crispy clean snow anywhere in the world. Mount Haleakala in Hawaii is one of the quietest places in the world. Rangers there often measure exactly zero sound. Its name in Hawaiian means House of the Sun. It was formed thanks to a one million year old volcano. Lava built up over the years and grew into a mountain. It has its own climate and weather that's almost impossible to predict. Now, it takes almost a week by ship to travel from South Africa to the world's most isolated settlement, Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. Great name alert. You need special local government permission to visit. The roughly 300 locals all treat each other as family, grow their own food, and keep their island impeccably clean. Daintree Forest in Australia is the oldest rainforest in the world. It's been around for over 100 million years, and it's home to 12,000 types of insects and about 90% of Australia's butterfly and bat population. It's also home to about 3,000 different kinds of plants. The Basarudu Archipelago in the Indian Ocean has crystal white sands and unspoiled coral reefs, and almost no tourists. It's an official marine reserve, so commercial fishing is off-limits. You can still see fishermen in traditional old boats, though. That's why the corals are still in perfect condition. Basarudu is also home to some of the last remaining sea cows. A mysterious emerald bamboo grove is located a short train ride away from Kyoto. It's like a portal into another universe. The creaking and rustling sounds make it one of the top 100 soundscapes in Japan. Local artists make baskets, coasters, and chopstick rests, all out of bamboo. The Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia is famous for its 1,000-year-old cedars, mossy waterfalls, water the color of granite, and crystal-clear streams. It's home to the rare cream-colored Kermode bear, also known as spirit bear. Add some Sitka deer, coastal gray wolves, cougars, mountain goats, orcas, salmon, sea lions, sea otters, humpback whales… um, you get the picture. The secret of the Candy Floss Pink Sand Beach in Barbuda is that it's made of crushed corals with tiny single-celled red things living beneath. You can see the famous pink shade when the waves are strong enough. This place doesn't have any public facilities, so it's much less crowded than other Caribbean islands, and that's why it's so clean. Now, it took thousands of years to form the Piccaninny Ponds in Australia. Underground water crept slowly up to the surface through all that limestone. 
It formed a large underwater cavern with amazing white walls. You need a special permit to dive there, but it's definitely worth it. Lapland in Finland has some of the cleanest air in the world. It also has those spectacular northern lights, snow-smothered trees, and endless white landscapes. The first humans arrived here around 7,000 years ago. They were mostly reindeer herders, and now there are more reindeer than there are people, and reindeer don't exactly pollute. The Plevisa Lakes National Park is one of the most popular tourist attractions in Croatia. It has 16 clear and colorful lakes, all connected by waterfalls. Deer, bears, wolves, boars, and rare birds roam around enjoying the unspoiled nature. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so they gotta keep it clean. 60 million years ago, a big and angry volcano woke up in present-day Northern Ireland. It spat out a bunch of molten basalt, a special type of lava. It cooled and turned into 40,000 interlocking stepping stones leading down to the sea. Local legend says they're so perfectly shaped because they were made by an Irish giant. He had to build a road into the sea to get to his foe in Scotland. Badabi Sirt in northern Iran has some unique travertine terraces, basically an epic staircase. It took thousands of years to form. Two different mineral hot springs flow downhill, leaving behind a jelly-like goo. It shaped the slope into a staircase when the water cooled. And the springs are still active. One has healing properties, the other shoots out dust that turns the water orange. When the sun comes out, it turns everything red, orange, and yellow. Bolivia's salty Laguna Colorada is a real magnet for worldly photographers. It gets its crimson red color from algae and rich minerals in the water. It's surrounded by high altitude desert plain, volcanoes, boiling mud, drifting snow, and weirdly shaped rocks. It's home to three of the world's six species of flamingo that come here for their fill of plankton. Flamingos are actually born white, but turn pink because of all that red algae. The Enchanted River is one of the most pristine, hidden, natural gems of the Philippines. It's tucked in behind some mountains, and no one really knows where the water comes from. There are loads of colorful fish swimming around, but where do they come from? Where do they go? Nobody knows. The river looks shallow, but no one's ever managed to measure how deep it is. Only a few thrill-seeking tourists visit this mysterious river to dive into its caves. Pangong Lake in the Himalayas is the world's highest saltwater lake. It has no aquatic life because of its saltiness, but it's a perfect place for bird watching. When it's a little warmer, the lake's constantly changing colors between blue, green, and even red. In the winter, it's pretty much ice. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh-so-delightful airplane meals must be cooked about 6 to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24-7. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically, 
Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it! So, if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails, those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes, are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings, one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure, though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, 
but they have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds. And it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. Ah yes, everyone loves a holiday. But figuring out what to pack in your luggage can be a daunting task, especially when you're limited on weight and baggage space. Not to mention you're likely to do some holiday shopping on your adventure away from home. So you're going to need extra space on your return for all those souvenirs you've collected. Accumulating too much weight or bulk can end up costing you a handsome fee with the airline if you're not properly prepared. But you can now relax. You just focus on booking your vacation. We'll take care of your luggage with these handy traveling tips. No doubt your clothes are going to take up the bulk of your luggage. Considering most airline standards permit one bag for most local trips and up to two bags for longer distances, that doesn't grant you a whole lot of space if you plan on being fashionable on your getaway, especially in the winter. However, this doesn't mean you have to turn your undergarments inside out for repeated use. The key here is to be clever with how you pack. Firstly, you might want to consider how you're folding your clothes. The most space-efficient method to store your wardrobe in a suitcase for travel is to roll up each item. Think of your clothes like those sleeping bags you used to take on your camping trips. They always seem too thick for their compacted covers, but with perseverance, you could roll it up tight enough to fit inside. Now, you don't need to wrestle with your clothes quite as much, but the same principle here applies. Start by folding your shirts, pants, and whatever else you plan on packing neatly, similar to how you might find them on a clothing store shelf. Then, when you have them in a relatively rectangular or squared off shape, roll them up tightly. Now that you have your little clothes logs, start packing them into your bag. And behold, extra space. Now, here's something we've all experienced arriving at our holiday destination. We drop our suitcase on the hotel bed, open it up, only to find all our clothes unfurled and scattered like a tornado stormed through our bag. Your luggage has had a rough journey from your home to your holiday destination. It's been dragged through airport terminals, tossed around by baggage handlers, and rocked back and forth during in-flight turbulence. A simple stationary item rubber bands will help you keep your clothes neat. Now that you've got them rolled up, place a couple of rubber bands around them to keep them from unfurling. This is an especially neat trick if you want to roll an outfit together as one. Maybe you've got head-to-toe denim that you can't wait to rock on your getaway. Fold up your clothes as before, then layer the different items of your ideal outfit atop each other. Roll them up as one, then use the rubber bands to keep them together. You can preemptively decide your day-to-day -day outfits before you even board the plane. However, you may still prefer to fold your clothes, especially business or formal shirts and pants. Lucky for you, we have a handy trick for that, too. Instead of folding each item individually, we're going to lay it out all on top of each other. Start with your shirts and tops, alternating with one on top and one on the bottom, keeping the necks of your shirts at the center. Work your way down to your pants and smaller items until they're all laid out flat. Try to keep your pants in the middle. Finally, start folding your items in on themselves, with the shirts creating the outer layer, until you end up with a neat bundle, like a present. 
you should be able to sit your bundle squarely into your bag. Want to save even more luggage space? Instead of putting your undergarments and socks into their own section, try fitting them into available spaces and gaps within the rest of your luggage. If you plan on taking a cap with you, for instance, the inside of your headwear is a great space to store your socks. This applies to other small luggage items too, such as phone chargers and ties. Though keep in mind that you can also lay your ties and belts out flat across the clothes in your luggage to conserve space. And if you're really limited on baggage size, say all you have is a carry-on for a fortnight long trip, here's another method. Get yourself some compression bags to store your clothes in. These bags will compact multiple sets of clothes into the size of a small laptop bag. Fold up the clothes you intend to pack and store them into the compression bag. You should be able to fit eight to 10 standard clothes items or a few bulky ones. Once you've filled the bag, seal it and squeeze the air out through the built-in one-way pressure valve. The easiest way to do this is either by rolling it, and you should be pretty good at rolling your clothes by now, or by using your knees to apply pressure. You should be able to fit two to four of these compression bags in your standard carry-on suitcase, which is especially helpful if you want to save money by avoiding checked-in luggage. And you can take even more clothes on board with you if you stick them into a pillowcase. The best thing about this tip is that it also doubles as a comfy pillow for you to rest your head on during the flight. If you do have a bit more space to spare, another great way to keep your stuff organized is with packing cubes. It might not be as space efficient as compression bags, but a lot of travelers prefer them for tidier and well-organized packing. You might like to divide them by outfits or clothes types, such as one for pants and one for tops. You can easily purchase packing cubes from most online retail services and travel and camping stores. There are also packing cubes specially designed for one or more pairs of shoes. This is a great way to compact the space your shoes would otherwise take up in your luggage and to keep your clean clothes from coming into contact with your footwear. Nobody wants their tops to smell like feet, right? If you're still struggling to bring all your items with you inside your suitcase, there are a couple more tricks that you can use for that extra bit of weight without the extra cost. The most obvious of which is to use your own body. <laughs> That's right, time to layer up. Pick out all your bulky items and wear as many as you can manage. You can try wearing some shorts under your pants or several layers of your winter wear, such as your sweater, jacket, and coat all over the top of one another. You might be sweating a little, but most airports and planes are well air conditioned. You can always shed some layers once you've boarded your flight. At least you'll have some warm wear to snuggle up in if you do get cold up there in the clouds. If you don't want to wear all those layers, there's actually another type of bag you can carry on the plane with you, free of charge. Get yourself a duty-free bag from any of the duty-free stores in the airport. You can even hang on to it for next time. Store all your extra items in your duty-free bag and carry it onto your flight at no additional cost. It's also worth considering what type of luggage you're using. More importantly, how much it weighs. A lot of people forget that the standard 15 pounds permitted by most airlines includes the actual weight of their suitcase. The bag itself can often weigh up to four to six pounds. That's a huge chunk of your weight in the bag alone. So when you're shopping for your luggage, take into account how much it weighs. Choosing a lighter bag will give you more space for the items you want to take with you. Stick to some of these handy tips and you'll be on your way with no shortage of luggage and some extra money to spend on your vacation. Happy flying! Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically, 
Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't, and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control, The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. 
It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time. But the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt, and forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the U.S., then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. the wrong person. I'm just a manager going back home from my annual vacation in Europe. The TSA agent pulls out a massive chunk of delicious French cheese from your hand luggage. Turns out, you can only grab really small amounts of soft cheese on board, since it's considered to be liquid. Fun fact, you can bring a cheese grater on board without any problems, but you can grate no more than 3.4 ounces. That's the maximum cheese amount. Wait, you can't grate it. Cheese should be safely sealed in a plastic bag. Good news, hard cheese is fine to travel with. Okay, they took your cheese. A large bottle of water, you're bad. Some cream tubes and other fancy souvenirs. Look at that fine Swiss knife you grabbed in Geneva. It now risks ending up in an auction. If you're lucky enough, the airport might provide a shipping service to get your precious souvenirs and even cheese, if it doesn't go bad, to your home for a fee. Still, not all the airports do this. So, some of the banned items will go to an auction to raise money. The confiscated items are usually sold in bulks, so it's going to be pretty hard to find the ones that you had to leave behind. Some other objects with more specific purposes are donated to different organizations. A uh, pepper spray, for instance, would go to a police training academy. As for cheese, prohibited exotic fruits, and other food and water, well, they usually just get disposed of. Some items, especially really bad and dangerous ones, may be simply melted or destroyed. Magic 8 balls pose no danger, but they have to be checked in luggage. The problem is the liquid inside them. Yeah, it might be less than 3.4 ounces, but let's face it, it's hard to count the exact amount. Ask your ball if you can take it on board. It's likely to give you a don't count on it answer.
Relieving gel insoles are a bit disturbing on board. The problem is the same. It's impossible to count the exact amount of liquid. So no gel insoles and no gel candles either. Perfume and nail polish are kind of forbidden too. It's not only about liquid on board restrictions, but also about etiquette rules. Some passengers may simply be allergic to their smell. Plus, they're flammable. As for nail polish removers, opt for an acetone-free version, since acetone is a no-go for hand luggage. Anyway, you can grab a bottle of perfume, as long as it's not too large and you don't use it on board. It would be a pity to leave a whole bottle in the trash bin before boarding. Still, you can sneak in the plane with more than 3.4 ounces of your favorite cream, claiming it's some medicine that you really need. But you do need to notify the airport beforehand. A bit weird, but it works. Sometimes. In case you need to check your body temperature on board, make sure your thermometer is electronic. Mercury ones are strictly forbidden. Who's going to pick up all the mercury balls if you accidentally drop it? Bowling pins are a no-go for hand luggage. Seems like the air crew doesn't want anyone to have fun and play bowling in the aisles during a long and boring flight. No, it's all about our safety. They just think bowling pins might hurt someone. No sports equipment is allowed, be it a fencing foil, a bat, or even darts. Darts are sharp, and no sharp objects are allowed on board. Such items should travel in check-in luggage, unless you want them to end up in an auction. If you're into handmade things, and a transatlantic flight gives you enough time to knit a scar for a pair of socks, opt for plastic or wooden knitting needles and wrap them carefully so as not to cause any damage. Those made of metal will probably be disposed of by melting, and they don't deserve such a fate. Snow globes, as with any other object containing liquid inside, aren't allowed through security. If your snow globe is as small as a tennis ball, you may be lucky to have it allowed, but it's better to play it safe and check the snow globe in. Liquid bleach is definitely a weird object for hand luggage, even if you're traveling in a white shirt. First, it's not allowed on board because it's highly flammable. Second, a brand new white shirt doesn't seem to be the right choice for a flight. <laughs> Coffee and turbulence just don't mix. Third, the bathroom on board is far too small for laundering. If you're a hairdresser on a business trip, you'll probably have to invest a bit more when booking your flight. No hair bleach is allowed on board. Scissors aren't welcome either, unless their blades are 4 inches or shorter. By the way, scissors that aren't allowed to fly are often donated to schools, which is a good alternative to disposing them. Bad news for hairdressers again. Due to a gas cartridge that's filled with butane, cordless curling irons aren't allowed on board. Good news, electric curling irons are completely fine and safe. If you're an artist, you must have already struggled with security rules. You don't want your paint to get frozen or ruined in the luggage section, so you'll surely want to bring it on board. Security may be okay with your oil paints, as long as they're under 3.4 ounces, but there's no way you can grab your extremely flammable turpentine. Now, in case you don't enjoy food on a plane and failed to order a meal on board beforehand, you can take any pan or pot on board and cook it yourself. No, you can't cook, and you can't grab a cast iron pan either. They're quite heavy, that's why they're likely to be dangerous. If a TSA agent confiscates it, it won't end up being donated to a local kitchen. It'll probably be melted. If you want to have some fresh smoothies while flying with fresh fruit that are allowed on board, like an apple or a banana, bad news for you. Blenders are allowed only in case you remove the blades, so technically it's not a blender anymore. Hey, here's when you need that cheese grater. English Christmas crackers can make a wonderful atmosphere of joy and happiness during Christmas holidays, but it brings nothing but a mess on board. It makes a cracking sound when pulled, which can frighten other passengers. They are not allowed in checked bags, just like party poppers and sparklers. High heels and thick soles aren't prohibited, but they do cause some problems. If you're wearing one of these, you may be asked to take them off to have them scanned. Sure, there are some plastic shoe covers, but ugh, these airport floors are swarming with germs. Wedding dresses are a bit of a problem too. Some dresses just don't fit in the x-ray machine, so they might need to be double-checked. All the fans of camping, beware. You probably want to check in a lot of luggage required for your trip, so make sure you check in the tent pegs too. Though, if you travel light with a carry-on backpack only, you'll probably need to buy some when you reach your destination. Since they're sharp objects, tent pegs are not allowed on board. It's hard to imagine anyone having a drill inside their 5-pound carry-on luggage. But anyways, these are not allowed. So, if you're a creative person who wants to bring a drill home as a vacation souvenir because magnets are lame, you'll have to check it in. If you want to sneak in a plane with a dry ice DIY fridge, you're almost sure to fail. 
It's flammable, so safety regulations definitely prohibit it on board. You can bring up to 5.5 pounds of dry ice, but airline permission is required. Anything with an uncovered blade is not allowed through security. Instead, a disposable razor or cartridge blades can be taken on board. Box cutters and knives, with a teeny tiny exception of a smooth butter knife, should be in checked luggage. Soap bars are allowed on board, but don't panic if a TSA agent wants to double check your bag after scanning it. It just may look a bit odd on the screen and mislead them. Liquid soap, instead, follows the universal liquid rule. Rules for batteries may vary. Spillable batteries are allowed neither in carry-on nor in checked luggage. And lithium batteries also can't be carried on board, only because if damaged, they can cause a fire. Okay, you travel with your Mr. Scratchy. And yes, a laser pointer is your furry friend's favorite toy. But you gotta make do without it this time, buddy. Laser pointers are not allowed in carry-on nor in checked luggage. A walking stick can be used as a mobility device and then let on board. But surprisingly, TSA may prohibit this item sometimes. Play it safe and notify your airline in advance. Bon voyage! Someone screaming for help. They've seen shark fins in the water. The lifeguard is waving a purple flag, but it's too late. The jellyfish have taken over. There's a huge wave approaching the shore at 90 degrees. Panic breaks at the beach. You have one chance to save them all with your time traveler kit. You take your beach survival guide with you and push the red button. Voila! You made it to the beach one hour before things went wrong. Some kids built a huge sandcastle. They were digging deep to get more and more sand. That pit they made right by the water can turn into a sinkhole. It doesn't fill completely, so Oi. someone can twist an ankle if they step in there. Sometimes, people even fall in huge sinkholes. The sand fills them back immediately and feels like concrete thrown at you. You tell everyone around the sandcastle to watch where they step. The spongy sand area here could be quicksand. It forms near riverbanks, marshes, and beaches, and is 70% water. It seems solid, so you check it with a stick and step on it lightly. It holds the weight. If someone doesn't know how to handle it, they might sink down to the waist. The secret for getting out is to stay calm and slowly wiggle your legs out lying on your back. You mark the area with four sticks for those who don't know the rules. You notice a wave quickly moving at right angle to the shore. Beach Survival Guide says it's a rip current. They can form in any part of the world. You tell everyone to stay out of the water until it's gone. Rip current corridors are usually narrow and not dangerous, but they can get long and wide as a bowling lane. This beast can pull you in the water even from the shore. If you get caught in a rip current, try to stay calm to save energy and come up with a good plan. Don't try to fight the current, it'll always win. Swim parallel to the shore until you're out of it. If that doesn't work, try to scream for help or wave a hand. If you're trying to save someone out of a rip current, throw them something that floats. If you go in the water to save them, both of you might need help. An older couple must want some quiet, so they swim closer to the pier away from the crowd. You get in the water to warn them it's a bad idea. Most rip currents form close to piers, jetties, and other structures in the water. But even a small current can carry you right into that stone construction. You spot a group of divers. They're carrying underwater cameras to take pictures of marine life. You tell them to watch out for flower urchins. They look like beautiful corals, but in fact have poisonous spines to scare away their predators. These spines are also dangerous for humans. If you step on any sea urchin, it feels like stepping on nails or glass. Some sea urchins also have venomous bites. Some sea snakes have more venom than cobras. They use it to paralyze fish, but will never attack humans first. Sometimes the tide washes them out of the water. They will pretend to be lifeless, but can still bite out of reflex. This bite can give you some nasty symptoms. The lionfish that lives in the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean Sea is one of the most beautiful sea predators. They can sting you by accident with their cobra-like venom. It hurts like the sting of a thousand bees. Some algal blooms, also called red tides, can have dangerous natural toxins in them. If you spot black, white, green, brown, purple, or red algae that looks like cottage cheese, thick soup, or a film on the water, 
keep your head and especially mouth and nose away from it. Also, take a shower after you get out of the water to be safe. Someone's shouting there's a stinging jellyfish in the water. You talk to the lifeguard to put up the purple flag. It's an international sign there are dangerous ocean animals nearby, mostly jellyfish. Some of them are harmless. Others, like box jellyfish, grow about the height of a human and are super dangerous. Lion's mane jellyfish loves colder water of the Pacific and Atlantic oceans and grows the size of a blue whale if you measure it with tentacles. It uses them to hunt. You take a loudspeaker and inform everyone what the purple flag means. It's best to stay out of the water when you see it. If you must get in the water, at least wear a diving suit to protect your skin. One jellyfish is lying motionless on the shore. You don't let anyone pick it up. It can still sting. If that happens, you gotta pour some clean water over your skin and then top it with vinegar. The heat becomes unbearable, and one family is looking for some shadow under the coconut tree. You tell them to find a different spot. A coconut is falling off the height of its tree at a crazy speed. Luckily, they move the towel right before it happened. While the family is looking for a new spot to park their towel, you remind them to drink plenty of water. It can save you from a heat stroke. They take more lives every year than floods, lightning, hurricane, and tornadoes combined. Plain water is the best drink choice for the beach to avoid having one. A sweet old lady takes out some bread to feed the seagulls. You run up to her and take the bread to protect her. When you hand bread to seagulls aloft, they can strike you. They can also hurt you with their bills or wings by accident as they fly by. If you feed them, they can follow you and raid your bags for more food if you don't give it to them. So the best you can do is throw all food remnants in trash cans with lids to keep the birds at bay. Two guys are watching a YouTube video about cross sea. It's a rare thing for most parts of the world and only happens regularly near one French island. When underwater current makes the water go one way and the wind sends it another, the waves run in squares, like a chessboard in the sea. Cross seas are super dangerous for swimmers and can even turn over a large boat. They form rip currents and powerful waves. The best you can do if you see it is stay out of the water. A huge wall of foam is moving towards you. It's a shore break, named so because it breaks directly on the sand or in shallow water with full force. If you get in its way, you might get seriously hurt. During shore breaks, water seems deeper than it really is. So when you dive in without checking the depth, you can injure yourself even more. Sometimes these shore breaks get so big and powerful, they can drop people to the ground and carry them into the sea. If that happens, and you start freezing in the water, don't try to swim too quickly to keep yourself warm. Relax your arms, control your breathing, and move your limbs as little as possible. Take the fetal position. It's like sitting in the water and hugging your knees. Try to keep some part of your body above the water to save heat. Your body temperature can also drop if you've been in the water for too long. Count to 10, and then back to 1. If you can't do it many times over and over, Get out of the water immediately, otherwise you could pass out in the water. When you get back to the safe shore, warm yourself up with towels, layers of clothing, and a hat. It's getting dark and you tell everyone to move out of the water. You only have one chance in 4 million to meet a shark at the beach, but it's more likely to happen at or after sunset and before sunrise. Sharks are most active at these times. You also have a better chance to spot it from the distance when it's bright and the sea is calm. You hear thunder roar somewhere in the distance. When that happens at the beach, it means you're already in lightning danger zone. The large open space of the beach and the water is one of the worst places to live through a storm. Everyone's packing and leaving for safety. Have you ever noticed that one of the flight attendants hides their hands behind their back when you enter the plane? Are they crossing their fingers for a safe takeoff? Nah, at this moment they're counting the passengers as they board. They have a special little counter for this. There are lots of stories about how bad airplane food is. In fact, it's not that bad. It's your sense of taste that's on the fritz because of the dry air. It dries your mouth out of all its saliva and dulls your sense of smell, which helps to feel 80% of what you taste. 
So, airline companies add more spices into the food so you can feel the taste. Seatbelts are located on the stomach because of the turbulence. When that happens, the plane sort of jumps up and down. Your waist belt holds you so that you don't crash into the ceiling of the aircraft. The shoulder seat belts in the car protect against horizontal collisions. By the way, flight attendants also have shoulder seat belts. It's because they always sit facing the passengers to keep order. While all passengers are flying face forward, the cabin crew sits backward. If the plane goes forward sharply, passengers get pushed into seats, and the flight attendants are held by shoulder and waist belts. Even if lightning strikes a plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with an aluminum layer that conducts electric current without passing it inside the plane. Good thing. And all electronics and fuel tanks are equipped with additional protection. Before any plane is released from the factory, all this protection is tested by simulating lightning. Many passengers get a headache during the flight, especially right after takeoff. This happens because you're getting up to an altitude higher than Mount Everest in about 10 minutes. The air up there is thin. Your brain gets less oxygen. By the way, chewing gum or candies can help. Now, the main reason why the seats on the plane are so uncomfortable is profit. Airlines want to make more money, so they try to fit as many passengers on the plane as possible. Because of this, there's so little space between the seats. Two additional rows in the cabin provide 12 new passengers. Also, companies make airplane seats lighter to spend less fuel. Seats become smaller and less comfortable. You can feel cold inside a plane, but when the plane is flying at high altitudes, the conditions resemble those in the Sahara Desert. It's all because of very low humidity. Every hour of flight, your body loses a lot of liquid. Stay hydrated, but only choose bottled water. Many companies don't show movies because they can make passengers too sad or emotional. Even if a movie doesn't have a dramatic story with incredible characters, it can still be heartbreaking for passengers. The thing is that our body experiences stress, and we take everything close to heart because of the lower oxygen levels. Also, we're sitting in seats at a high altitude and very far from home. Our brain realizes we're out of control of the situation. This feeling of helplessness can throw a person's emotions out of whack. So, companies only show positive movies and comedies. Some passengers say they feel like they can't think straight during the flight. This happens because of a lack of oxygen. So, your mind isn't in top form. Well, better not do any important tasks or make any important decisions. Your corneas are the one part of your body that doesn't have a blood supply. The only way they get oxygen is from the air. So, worsened eyesight and dry eyes are common problems on airplanes. The best solution here is to take with you eye drops along with gum. That worsened vision is the first reason the crew dims the lights and asks you to open the windows during nighttime takeoffs and landings. Your eyes need to be adjusted to the dimness in case of an emergency. The second reason is the plane crew needs to be able to see out the window. There's a theory that hair grows faster during the flight. Some people notice that little stubble appears on their faces after the flight, even if they shaved a few hours before they got on the plane. Anyway, this theory is not confirmed. Some say the cabin pressure, lower temperature, or even heightened stress levels can accelerate hair growth. If you experience stress and get nervous right after you step on the plane, your best solution can be a little training. Go to the gym or make a set of squats before boarding to prevent stress. Also, a good workout compensates for the hours you spend sitting still. Airlines lose and send in the wrong direction several million lost bags a year. Almost half of the lost luggage is lost because of transfer issues. They may not deliver your suitcase just because of lack of time. A plane can fly away before loaders put your luggage there. When this happens, they might carry these bags to another flight. And when your bag goes to the wrong place, it can be taken by other passengers accidentally. If you want to find your lost luggage quickly, take a photo of it in advance and then show it to the airport workers. 
You can also buy a special GPS tracker and put it in your suitcase. It works for 6 days, and you can use your phone to locate your luggage wherever it is. Airport staff take unclaimed luggage to a special center. If the owner doesn't show up within 3 months, the things inside the bags will be put up for sale in specialized stores. There, you can find clothes, jewelry, and electronic devices. And of course, it all comes with a big discount. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding is not my stomach. It is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right under the cabin of the aircraft, so it sounds quite loud. Aircraft tires can withstand pressure 4 to 5 times more than a plane actually gives them during landing. The metal wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots also have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can go well even if one of the pilots feels bad because of a stale burrito. If two pilots ate the same burritos, they could lead to problems. Oxygen masks drop down when the air pressure changes. At a certain height, there can be less air in the cabin. To prevent passengers from feeling this, they should put on oxygen masks. When pilots descend to a safe altitude, you can breathe without the mask again. By the way, masks only have oxygen for 15 minutes. This is enough for the pilots to descend to a safe altitude on which passengers can breathe. The wings of most passenger planes are located at the bottom of the plane. It's built this way because of the engine. It should be installed under low wings because it's closer to the ground and easier to repair. Another reason is that the wing should take a big part of the blow during a bad landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. Fuel tanks installed in the wings are empty after the flight, and it helps to stay on the water too. The wings of cargo planes are located at the top to make it easy to load the cargo since the hull is located very close to the ground. Also, it helps to avoid getting debris into the engines in case when airfields aren't clean. Plus, this wing location has less aerodynamic resistance during the flight. Little triangles on the aircraft walls are special labels for flight attendants. The triangles mark special windows. You can see flashing indicators through these windows. It signals the landing gear is retracted and the flaps are closed. But for ordinary passengers, this is the place with the best view of the wings. Turbulence is a common thing during a flight. But usually, it's so insignificant, most passengers don't even feel it. Strong turbulence is rare. By the way, turbulence is just hot and cold air affecting a plane. For better understanding, imagine a big balloon people fly on. Remember the flamethrower installed under the ball? It heats up the air and the hot air raises the ball up. So turbulence is the hot air created by nature and it makes the same thing with a plane that it makes with a balloon. Also, turbulence can occur if the plane gets under the hot air stream left by another plane. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be clean to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. 
Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, The ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin. So you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4 to 5 times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask. And pilots must always remain conscious. 
The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, but not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shape. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. Now, maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. Check around the corner, under the bed. Wait, what's that hiding over there? Hotels are supposed to be your home away from home, but do you know what secrets they're keeping? Here's what no staff member or manager would ever tell you. Some hotel owners are very superstitious of the number 13, or they know guests might be. Whatever the case, you may find room 13 or the entire 13th floor completely missing. In the Far East, the same can be said about the number 4. You can easily get an upgraded room without any additional charge if you have a birthday, anniversary, or wedding. Just call ahead of time and warn them about the upcoming event. You might be checking that bed for stains and bugs, but you're probably overlooking the dirtiest thing in the room – the TV remote. It doesn't get disinfected between guests. Put it in a plastic sandwich baggie before using it. Plenty of other filthy things in that room, but we'll touch on those later. Every hotel has a place where housekeeping stores forgotten things. The most frequently lost items are phone chargers, but more interesting discoveries have been found. False teeth, glass eyes, and even boxes of worms. If no one comes for these strange treasures after 5 or 10 years, yes, they're nice enough to wait. The cleaners raffle the lost items among themselves. Some luxury ones may have hidden cameras built in for safety reasons. The most common place for this is the door peepholes. So always put a piece of masking tape or putty over the one in your room. But hidden cameras in the room itself are never okay. To check the place, turn off the overhead light and switch on your phone's front-facing camera. Slowly scan the room your front camera will pick up their infrared light. Common spots are near the bed and in the bathroom, so check those areas thoroughly. 
hotel owners often let their friends and family stay for free. You wouldn't know it since they usually leave before peak season starts. The employees and cleaners also get in on some perks. They keep towels, slippers, bathrobes, and shampoos. But what you might not know is that hotel chains are fine with you taking things from the room. Stationery, toiletries, coffee mugs, umbrellas, anything with their name and logo on it. This will serve as free advertisement when you take those things with you. Those beautiful, bright vegetables and fruits near the hotel restaurant's entrance aren't just a decoration. They trick your body into feeling full before you even get your plate. You eat less, and the company saves money. They may give you extra bottles of shower gel or other toiletries, but there are ones that charge you for grabbing too much food during the breakfast buffet. To avoid upsetting the cooks with the amount of discarded food, some hotels in certain countries make their guests pay for anything left uneaten on the plate. No hotel chain would willingly tell you how to get the biggest discount for your stay. So if you have a limited budget, make a reservation after 6 p.m. This is when the sales department tries to sell all canceled reservations at the last minute. That often means cutting the price down, sometimes in half. The first Sunday of the month is the best time to check in. Vacationers are leaving, business travelers haven't arrived yet, so most of the best rooms will be available. To get the top pick, use a special service called Rooming. You can view everything in the hotel and choose which room you like the most. Just ask the receptionist about it. They won't willingly speak up about other free services unless you ask. Free phone chargers, hair irons, bottled water, and board games are among them. They can also order a transfer for you, book concert or theater tickets, and wake you up at a specified time. Hotels can refuse you a check-in, even if you've paid for a booking in advance. They can cancel your reservation if you don't show up before 6 p.m. If something's holding you up on your way, call and let them know in advance. Even if you arrive on time, you can still be denied a room. It usually happens when the hotel is overbooked. In that case, they might redirect you to a different one. Even more surprising, the chances of this happening depend on who you are. Young single men, couples, and groups of friends will usually get the boot before a family or a single older woman. It's because the first group is usually more flexible about the unexpected move. Before you pounce on that minibar, better check to see if those drinks are sealed. Hotel workers say they've had cases where guests finished all the provided beverages and then filled the bottles up with tap water to avoid paying for them. Shh, you didn't hear it from me. Large chains often have their own special transport for meeting important guests or getting around town. Their own taxis are usually cheaper than city ones. So if you want to save some money, check the cost of their transport at the reception. But don't ask the receptionist to recommend where you should have a meal. The hotel clerk will point you to a local place that pays them for the recommendations, even if it's overpriced and tasteless there. Guests don't really pay for the room itself, but for the hotel's location. Proximity to the airport, the beach, downtown, and famous sites will cost you an additional amount. Yes, even if it doesn't have any stars at all, and the conditions inside aren't great. Think twice before handing over your keys for valet parking. There have been cases when hotel workers took an expensive car for a joyride and even filmed it. My car? No. A famous person could be staying in the room right next to you. Nobody would know it since they get to use made-up names to conceal their identity. For the rest of us common folk, that's not allowed. You requested a single room with a big bed and a nice view of the beach. What you got? A room with two small beds and a lovely view of a brick wall. It happens all the time. But they're supposed to give you compensation or some free service to make up for the difference. Know your right to this if the manager doesn't offer. The safe in your room can be anything but safe. If you have some valuables, ask the receptionist to put them in the main hotel safe up front. This place is usually much more secure, 
since all the staff doesn't have access to it. Although hotel chairs and sofas look clean, wait till you see one under a microscope. Don't sit on them without first laying down a towel or blanket. You don't know if the guests before you had their feet up on the furniture. And their feet would certainly be filthy, since the room's carpets are rarely shampooed, maybe once a year or even less. That being said, don't walk on them barefoot. If you use slippers or keep your shoes on, make sure to put shower caps on the bottoms when you pack them into your suitcase before leaving. Same story with that bed. Before you lie down on it, know that the cleaning staff might launder the linens between guests, but not that big, beautiful, germy bedspread. Don't touch the drinking glasses either. Even if they get a wipe down, it was probably with the same cloth used to clean other surfaces. Why? Well, because staff have only 20 to 30 minutes to clean each room completely. So they need to do it quickly, not thoroughly. Things that often get overlooked light switches, door and drawer handles, remotes. Ironically enough, it's the things that get touched most often. Experts have found that these items have as much germs on them as the toilet. Solution? Always bring plenty of antibacterial wipes. And if you ask about the hotel's cleaning practices, remember, cleaning doesn't mean disinfecting. Choose your words wisely and don't give the manager a loophole. Hotels are places where you know for sure lots of people stay every day. And not all of those places pay attention to cleanliness as much as they should. There can be bed bugs and other pests around that you won't notice until it's too late. So here's the deal. When you arrive at a hotel and open your room, don't rush to open your bags and put all your clothes onto the shelves, and especially the bed. Better place your bags into the bathtub for the time being and go check the room for those pesky bugs. Check out all the rugs, soft furniture, cushions, and all other places that pests could live in. Only after you've done that, take your bags out of the bathtub and unpack. The bathtub is the safest place because no bugs are able to survive there. So naturally, none of them will crawl into your stuff while you're not looking. You may want to throw that comforter on the floor at once, by the way. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Same goes for your bedding. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Ever wondered why they never use fitted sheets in hotels? They might be convenient, but they're impractical for hotel use. The sheets are changed much more often than you do it at home, and the elastic becomes worn out all too soon. Besides, it's a nightmare to store fitted sheets. They have to be of two different sizes, one for either type of bed. It's just easier to take two universal flat sheets per double bed and get on with it. Speaking of sheets, you must have noticed that bed linen and towels in hotels are almost always white. The first reason is convenience, of course. When everything is white, it's easy to wash it all together and use bleach to get rid of any possible stains. The second explanation, however, is customer experience. According to public polls, people perceive a white color as luxurious and fresh which makes their stay more pleasant. If you see an unusually attractive wow. price for a room on a website, be careful. It might not include a mandatory resort fee. If you have an option to pay for a room in advance, you'll see the final cost at the checkout. It'll normally list the initial price you saw before booking and all the extra charges, resort fee included. If you decide to pay at the hotel though, you might be up for a surprise when you check out so always make sure to read the fine print. You may have seen a rather weird thing in many hotels, a phone in the bathroom, especially just next to the toilet. You'd probably be surprised to know that it's an actual requirement for hotels to receive a four diamond rating from AAA. But this also makes pretty good sense. For example, if you slip and fall on the wet floor of the bathroom, a phone can be handy to call for help. Returning to bathrooms, Hotels typically don't provide plungers in rooms. 
You see, hotels want you to have a feeling that you're the first person ever to enter the room you're staying in. It's a question of your comfort, which is the primary concern of any respectable hotel. And a plunger in the bathroom, according to anonymous polls, makes people think that the toilet may malfunction at some point, which doesn't help the image. If your hotel has card keys with magnetic strips, make sure you put your card key apart from your cell phone and wallet. The problem is that key cards are rewritten quite a lot, and they're designed for that process to be quick and easy. So a fairly strong magnet, like the one in your cell phone, could erase your key card, and you wouldn't be able to get inside your room. The hotel will surely provide you with a new card, but that's still inconvenient. Many hotels only accept credit cards as a form of payment, and without one, you won't be able to book a room directly or use the paid services provided by the place. Booking a room is just the first step of your stay at a hotel. During your vacation or business trip, you might use the mini bar or other paid services that you'll only have to pay for at the checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds on it to cover all your expenses, the hotel has no means to get their money apart from suing you. If you pay with a credit card, however, all the additional costs go to the bank and everyone's happy. The time of check-in and check-out is fixed not to annoy you. It's done so you don't barge in onto guests who stayed in the room you booked, and the hotel staff can clean the room and prepare it for the next guest's arrival. By the way, the check-out time is normally about 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. because hotels actually care about your well-being. They not only let you have your breakfast, but also give you some time to prepare for departure without hurry. Isn't it kind of annoying that many hotels don't have a socket near the bed? In fact, time is to blame in this case. Lots of hotels around the world were built before mobile phones and other portable devices became so popular and widespread. Back then, of course, they didn't need bedside sockets, and many of them haven't yet caught up with the times. You can avoid this issue if you stay at a hotel that's been built relatively recently. Once you're at the check-in desk, it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research of their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionists. Sometimes, they may play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order, as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller items is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you may also want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information? Hotels usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance that you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there are no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat, safe and sound. Most, if not all, hotels have fully carpeted floors, and there's a couple of very good reasons for that. First of all, it's your safety. You're far less likely to slip and fall on a carpet than on a wooden or tiled floor. Secondly, it's much more cost-effective because it's faster and cheaper to replace a spoiled carpet than change the whole flooring in a room. And finally, carpets add to the room's soundproofing, which you'll be thankful for if you have overly active neighbors. 
Ever wondered what a continental breakfast is and why it's called that? In fact, the name comes from the UK, which is a group of islands, and it means a breakfast that's served in continental Europe. It may include pastries, sliced bread with different toppings, meat, cheese, fruit juice, and hot beverages. You can easily remove post-it notes because their adhesive is not even. Sticky notes feature a plastic adhesive. It's spread out in blobs across that sticky part of the paper. When you slap a post-it onto a bulletin board, not all the blobs, that are technically called microcapsules, will actually touch the surface to keep the paper stuck there. You can easily unstick it. And then, when you want to reattach it to something else, those blobs of glue that are left unused will take over the role of the adhesive. Eventually, you'll use all the capsules of glue, or they'll simply get clogged with dirt. So, the note won't stick anymore. It's very satisfying to chew gum because it's made of rubber. Gum from before had an elastic texture because of something called chicle, a natural type of latex rubber. Now you can chew your bubble gum easily because it's made of synthetic rubber. Some of these are used in car tires too, while others are used in Elmer's glue because they mimic the effect of chicle. Office buildings are a bit taller during the night. When the employees are finished with work, they all go home. Tall office buildings get slightly taller. For example, a 1,300-foot tall skyscraper will shrink about 0.03 inches under the weight of 50,000 people inside, assuming they're all an average weight. You could actually heat your house with just 70 people. If you've ever been trapped in a small crowded room, you know people give off body heat. So you'd need about 70 people in motion to warm up your home in the winter using just their body heat. Or maybe 140 people standing still, if you consider the house uses four electrical storage heaters and humans radiate approximately 100 to 200 watts of heat in normal conditions. Why does glass break so easily? It's because its atoms are not very tightly arranged. Unlike other solid material like metal, glass is made up of amorphous, which basically means structureless, loosely packed and randomly arranged atoms. These atoms can't rearrange themselves that quickly to retain a firm structure, so glass collapses and fragments shatter everywhere. Do you know why airplane passenger windows are mostly below eye level? Aircraft are way cheaper, stronger, and easier to build without windows, but they're there because many people like the view. Particularly about 100 years ago, when flights were often conducted at low altitudes. Also, if some passengers are feeling sick, looking out the window can help them reconnect their sense of balance, as their eyes are continually reporting what's going on around them. Windows in this position also help distribute the load around them more evenly. The floor of the cabin where people sit isn't all the way at the bottom of the aircraft, which is why windows end up being quite low compared to both the overall volume of the cabin itself and the eye level of the passengers sitting down. Water feels colder than air at the same temperature because it's denser. Because of that, your body loses heat 25 times faster while surrounded by water than it would if it was surrounded by air that was the same temperature. Since it's so dense, water has a high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of heat to raise its temperature just a little bit. Water is good at both retaining heat and cold. That's why the ocean is way cooler than land, and at the same time, the hot soup stays hot for a long time. Water is also a pretty good conductor, which means it effectively transfers either heat or cold to the human body. Have you ever wondered why water cleans so well? It's because of its asymmetrical molecules. They are made of two hydrogen atoms stuck to a single oxygen atom, which means they're triangular. That's why they have a slightly different charge on their different sides, similar to a magnet. The oxygen end of the molecule is slightly negative, while the hydrogen is slightly positive. Because of this feature, water is great at sticking to other molecules. So, when you want to wash away dirt, water molecules will stick to the dirt. They'll pull it away from the surface the dirt was on, no matter what it is. This is why water has surface tension. It's capable of sticking to itself, too. House cats share some similarities with big wild cats, but one of the things that sets them apart is their vocalization. The majority of large cats, like tigers and lions, will roar loudly so everyone knows they're coming to defend their territory. But with house cats, most of the time, you'll just hear purrs and meows. That's because of the physiology of their throat and voice box. 
which helps create these feline vocalizations. So a cat can either roar or purr, but no cat can do both. Bobcats, cougars, house cats, cheetahs, they purr. Purring is specific because a cat creates it when it breathes in and when it breathes out. Roaring has evolved in a particular lineage of big cats, which includes tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards, except the snow leopard, who lost this ability. They are capable of roaring because of the bendy bones in their throat. Mammals have their voice box in the throat, where air passing by its structures produces sounds. The vocal cords in the hyoid bones are the two main parts of the larynx that create different vocalizations in cats. You probably also prefer the pulse setting on your blender. And why wouldn't you? It just works better. And that's because of turbulence. When a blender stops chopping up food and starts spinning it around in circles only, everything you put inside is spinning at the same rate. It's not really about blending ingredients together, but about something called laminar flow. That means all the layers of liquid are continuously moving in the same direction. When you use the pulse function, your blender adds turbulence. So the fruit chunks are not just rolling around the sides of the blender, but they are falling into the center, which is when it's easier to blend them. So you'd like to open your window during a warm spring or summer day. It's so nice to hear the birds singing, and even when you come back an hour later, you'll probably still hear them singing the same song. They're hard workers, and the males are most likely guarding their territory and trying to attract a female. And other animals have their own tactics. Some like to rub their scent everywhere, but birds use a song to send the message, Hey, I'm letting everyone know, especially other males in the area, this is my space. So they'll continue singing the same song over and over again. During the winter, they will most likely sing fewer notes to each other, or just one note. They want to let others know that where they are is their space. Plus, they're trying to figure out if there's any food somewhere nearby. Why do cats like small spaces? First of all, they are solitary animals, which is why they always search for a safe hiding place to take a good nap. And if you see a cat curled in a tiny box, it was probably just trying to find a nice warm spot to sleep and avoid the cold floor. Cats prefer room temperatures to be about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. A bit cooler than this is comfortable for us. And if there isn't a convenient sunbeam to lie in, they will look for other solutions, like a cozy shoebox. Cats are pretty lazy. They can sleep up to 18 hours a day, most average between 10 and 13 hours on a daily basis. The majority of cats are most active during dawn and dusk. They're not the nocturnal animals that some of us think they are but a specific category called crepuscular animals, together with other creatures like hamsters, ferrets, and stray dogs. Over millions of years, cats have evolved to become low-light predators. Their eyesight is adapted for activities during twilight. And since that's when they're most active, they save their energy for dusk and dawn. Before they became domesticated, cats would have had to expend large amounts of energy at these times, finding, going after, and catching their prey. House cats no longer need to hunt before each meal, but their natural instincts still encourage them to conserve energy for twilight periods. Why are four-leaf clovers so rare? Similar to animals, plant genes are located in small packages of DNA in the nucleus of each cell. They're called chromosomes. Our chromosomes come in matched pairs, but clovers have four copies of every chromosome per cell. There's a gene responsible for four-leaf clovers, and it's recessive. That means this plant will create four leaves only if it has a four-leaf gene on all four chromosomes. And that's pretty rare. Also, some environmental conditions like soil activity and temperature can also affect whether the four leaves appear. Interestingly, these anomalies tend to happen in clusters. So if you find one, look around you. There might be more of them. You just booked a last-minute holiday and have three hours before the flight. You grab everything you can see, drop it into a suitcase, top it with your sunscreen, and rush to the airport. You run through security and make it one minute before check-in closes. A friendly airline agent asks you to put your suitcase onto the scale and enters it into the baggage handling system. Your suitcase gets a tag with a unique 10-digit barcode. It has your flight information on it. Many airports and airlines use a new technology with radio frequency identification chips to track your baggage in real time. This could help solve the problem of lost and delayed bags. So your suitcase disappears behind the rubber curtain. 
Now its epic journey on the conveyor belt begins. At larger airports, it goes on for miles. It's like a roller coaster with thousands of bags traveling at the same time. Don't miss the right turn. Once again, this time to the left. Oops, one of the bags just flipped over to another lane. Hopefully, it has all the right tags and will get on the right flight. Another turn. It's like a busy highway in rush hour. First stop, security checkpoint. The bags are scanned with an x-ray machine and often with chemical sniffers. If something seems suspicious about a certain bag, it will also be inspected by hand. All clear. Your bag makes it to a huge warehouse. In here, robots or staff go through your baggage to send it to the right plane. They can scan the tag your suitcase received at check-in. Some bags stay in the sorting point for a while. They must be off to later flights. Your suitcase gets on a bag cart together with plenty of others. Airport ramp agents control the process. The bag tug pulls the cart onto the tarmac. Baggage handlers load it onto the plane and it takes off. As the plane lands at your destination, another crew of baggage handlers welcomes it. They unload all the bags and take them to the terminal. This time, the journey is way shorter. Your suitcase goes straight onto the baggage carousel and you're happily reunited <laughs> with it. This ideal scenario works around 99% of the time. When you have a connecting flight, your bag will be moved from plane to plane with you. If you miss the connecting flight through your fault, your bag will make it to the second plane without you and wait for you there. When your layover is less than 60 minutes, check-in agent mislabels your bag by accident or the tag gets detached on your way, your baggage might get lost. When the airline figures out what went wrong, they'll send it on the next flight to your destination. If they can't find and return it to the owner, or you don't claim it within 90 days, the contents of your bag can go for charity. They also sell them as second-hand goods. The most unusual of those unclaimed things ends up at special museums, ancient Egyptian artifacts, a huge uncut emerald, 1770s violins, naval guidance system, and a replica of a suit of armor created in the 19th century are just a few examples of those unclaimed items. Travel security also confiscates hundreds of thousands of items each year. Some of them are thrown away, others are donated to nonprofits or schools, and stuff like self-defense sprays is used for training purposes. To increase your odds of happily reuniting with your bag, check in as early as you can. This way, the airline will have enough time to get your belongings to the right place. Double check that the agent has printed the right three-letter code of the airport you're flying to on your baggage tag. Before checking your bag, label it outside and inside. Don't write your home address on the outside label. Thieves can use that information to break into your home while you're on vacation. You can leave your office address or just mention your phone number or email address. Duct tape a card with your name and address to the inside lid of your bag. If the outer tag falls off, airline agents will be able to identify the bag by the inside tag. Remove all the old tags from previous flights. Airport staff have to work with thousands of bags every day and have only a second for yours. They can easily make a mistake if they see more than one tag. Make sure all the pockets and compartments on your bag are zipped and fastened well. Don't leave any loose ends or tie things like laced shoes to the handle. Your backpack straps mustn't dangle in all directions. If any of those items hang on to something on the conveyor belt, they could be ruined or lost. Make a list of all the items or at least the most expensive ones in your phone. Take a picture of the outside and contents of your bag. If you have to file a claim for a lost bag or confirm a missing item, it will be super handy. You can also print out a copy of that picture and leave it at the airport to help them find your bag easier. Don't put any liquids in the front pocket or on top of your things. When baggage handlers toss the bag on the cart, that shampoo or lotion bottle can get damaged and leak. Cover liquid bottles with duct tape and put them in a separate sealable plastic bag. Keep that bag in the main compartment. Put the heaviest items on the bottom of your bag near the wheels. This way, it won't tip over. Pack super tightly and make it more stable. Mark your bag with a bright ribbon, an unusual tag or sticker. Add yellow duct tape. Put on a vibrant cover. Make it stand out. This way, no one will grab it before you on baggage claim by accident. Go for waterproof luggage. Don't buy the most expensive looking bag. It's a magnet for thieves. If you're a heavy packer, buy a luggage scale and use it before you leave for the airport. Don't get too close to the weight limit. Airport luggage scales may be a bit off and you'd have to pay for extra weight. Plan your outfits before you pack and wear the heaviest clothing during the trip. Roll your clothes to avoid wrinkles and lines and save packing space. Put your socks and underwear in a small reusable cloth bag. Pack your shoes inside a shower cap to keep the bag clean. Stuff those shoes and other hollow things with souvenirs or similar trinkets. Put a laundry dryer sheet in the bag to make your clothes smell great. Don't pack any food items that perish quickly. If your bag gets delayed, they'll make the rest of your things smell like disaster. Add a TSA-friendly lock to your bag. 
the agents will be able to open it safely with the master key if it's randomly selected for additional screening. If you secure it with a non-compatible lock, they'll have to break it to open your bag. It will continue the journey with no lock whatsoever. Choose combination locks over padlocks. You can easily lose tiny padlock keys while traveling, and then you'd have to break that lock at your final destination. Three-digit locks are more common, but you can find four-digit models for extra security. Pick a metal lock in some bright color to make your bag safe and easier to recognize. If you don't want to buy a lock, use cable ties instead. If your luggage has lockable zips, pull the largest cable tie that fits through the loops. If your bag doesn't have the dedicated loops, thread the cable tie through a little notch in each of the zips instead. Pack some scissors, blades, a nail file, or some other tool to cut the cable ties in an unlocked pocket of your checked bag. Sign up for bag tracking. Some airlines let you do it through a mobile app. Your checked-in baggage will be scanned at check-in, during loading onto the plane, on transfer from one flight to another, and when it arrives at the final destination. You can also buy a GPS tracker or luggage that comes with it. Never put cameras, laptops, cell phones, tablets, and even portable hard drives in your checked-in bags. If for some reason you have to check them in, make sure they're completely off, protected from accidental activation, and well-packed. Your makeup bag, jewelry, meds, especially prescription ones, don't belong in your checked-in bag either. If you have to bring lithium batteries with you, put them in your carry-on in manufacturer's packaging or covered with tape. Lithium batteries with unprotected electrodes can contact loose metal objects and ignite. If it happens inside the cargo hold, no one will be able to stop it. Check if your insurance would cover some of your losses if things go wrong. If you have expensive clothes and luggage itself, purchase excess valuation from the airline. Otherwise, your compensation for lost or damaged bags will be not so generous. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, Get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait. Where are you running? There's no need to hurry. The trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle, and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then your bag may end up in another part of the plane, and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh! Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, 
even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. Ten miles away from another plane, and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting, Traffic! Traffic! Five miles closer, and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. But you know what may help you? Noise-canceling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes means some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seatbelts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there is a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights. If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch some shut-eye. These bedrooms, called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds and the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square, but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots, this made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. 
Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. The marble caves in Chile are one of the most far-off natural wonders of the world. The cathedral, the chapel, and the cave are the three main attractions. They're a group of black and white caverns, columns, and tunnels made of marble. Waves have been shaping them over thousands of years, and they're still going strong. The caves and turquoise water waves team up to make a sweet light show. When summer starts, an ordinary-looking river in Colombia transforms into a liquid rainbow. Caño Cristales, also known as the most beautiful river in the world, sparkles in five colors – red, black, green, blue, and yellow. It only looks like this for six months a year because of the special underwater plant that makes all those colors. It needs the perfect amount of sunshine and water to work.